right. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, and uh, we're talking about the judgment of believers now. And related to the issue, in a, a sense, of the judgment of believers is the death of believers. Uh, and these are questions that are often raised. Um, we think about the death of believers. The fact is that everyone dies. Everyone dies. When we look at scripture, uh, both wise Solomon dies with foolish Nabal, right? The rich man dies and Lazarus dies. Herod dies and John the Baptist dies. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has died and you and I will die. In Genesis chapter three, verse 19, the Bible says, for dust you are and to dust you shall return. Everybody dies. And after the fall of man, every entry in the genealogy of Adam in Genesis five ends with, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. It's the Lord making a point there with that, everybody dies. And the Bible speaks of our time here as being very short, that our death is rapidly approaching. Psalm 103 verse 15 says, as for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it and it's gone and its place remembers it no more. The Bible speaks now of death. I mean, think about this as it relates to the believer. The Bible speaks of death as a punishment for sin. As a punishment for sin. Romans chapter five, verse 12, the Bible reads that through one man, Sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Romans chapter six, verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death. Now to the believer, if you think about this simple fact, the believer might ask the question then, since believers are justified, since they are made right with God through faith in Christ, and think about the implications of these things, because Christ has paid in full our penalty and Christ himself died for us as our substitute, Christ is a complete savior, not a partial savior, and he's left believers with neither guilt nor punishment. And so why is it that believers still die? Why do we still die? Why does God still lead us through that terrible ordeal of death? You know, like Enoch or Elijah, why doesn't God just take us off the earth when he's done with us? <laughs> put us in a fiery chariot, take us home, the Uber chariot <laughs> to take us to heaven, zap us to heaven whenever he's done with us. Why do believers die? Well, if you think about it now, the difference lie, or the answer to that question lies in the difference between the death of believers and unbelievers. Death for the believer is very different than death for the ungodly. I mean, you may want to write some of these things down. These are very simple and a simple overview. Death for the believer is very different than death for the ungodly. One, believers immediately go to the Lord to be present with the Lord when they die. Verse eight says here in 2 Corinthians chapter five, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And we talked about the intermediate state. We're absent from this body, but we go immediately to be with the Lord upon our death. Secondly, Believers enter into death knowing that it's a gateway to heaven. It's just the entrance way into heaven. Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And to depart and to be with Christ is far better. But thirdly, believers know that the sting of death, the power of death has been removed. Death is not the end of life for believers, but just the beginning of a perfect life they will now live for all eternity. Death is no longer punishment. To the believer, in essence, death is reward. To die is gain. Listen to Paul near his own death and see if you sense in Paul's statement any remorse about dying. He said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he said, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. He was nearing the time of his death. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, you hear in that word, this expectation. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. 
You know, for all these good reasons, we are confident, aren't we? As Christians, as believers, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Revelation 14, verse 13 says, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from now on. We still haven't answered our question as we're considering this. Why do believers then still die? There's a difference between the death of the ungodly and the death of believers. How does that answer our question? The explanation that we can gather from scripture is that for the believer, rather than judgment or rather than punishment, death is the final culmination of fatherly chastisements of God designed to sanctify his people. Listen to this from Hebrews chapter 12 that relates to what we're talking about beginning in verse 6. The Bible reads, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. You know, similar to temporal judgments in life, for the unbeliever, death is punishment. For the believer, those temporal consequences, even the temporal consequences for sin, all work together for our good, don't they? That's what the Bible says, what the Bible promises to the people of God. All things work together for the good of those who are the called according to his purpose. Now think of the many ways in which believers then are trained by the chastening of death. Even the thought of death, even the thought of death has beneficial effect for the people of God. Think of how humbling that thought is. When you think about death, doesn't it make you think about your life? It motivates you, doesn't it? The thought of death motivates you to mortify the flesh to overcome sin. It's a check on worldliness. It's a motivator to overcome. It's to foster hope in Christ and to foster heavenly mindedness, knowing that our days here are short. It's a a supreme test of faith. It's a test of trust and a test of hope, to hope in him as we face death. So all these good ways in which that chastening, that final culminating chastening of God provides for a final sanctification of God's people. Now, just as Jesus Christ entered glory through the path of suffering and death, and so do they whom he is not ashamed to call his brothers. In Hebrews chapter nine, verse 27, the Bible says it's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Now, in the very same way, and thinking about this idea of the judgment for believers, in the very same way, a believer might ask, why does the Bible say then that believers enter into judgment? Why do believers then enter into judgment? Didn't Christ pay our penalty? Didn't the judgment that was allotted to us fall on him on the cross? Hasn't Christ already been judged for us? Now let's look at our text beginning in verse nine and we'll answer that question. Why do believers enter into judgment? Verse nine. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Now, why? Why? Verse 10. For, because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. If you take a look at verse nine, here's how this fits with the Christian life. These things sometimes are are thought by some to just be nothing more than intellectual exercises, right? Just to take a subject like this, to learn the details, learn the nuts and bolts, but this is to impact the way that we think, the way that we live. We make it, verse nine, our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Why? What's the motivation? Because we're gonna appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, for the believer... We need to think through that and let that sink into our minds, sink into our thinking, sink into our hearts. We're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That should be a motivating factor to live for Christ, to be well-pleasing to him. Knowing this, this idea of the judgment of the believer should promote our sanctification. In the same way that the difference between death for the ungodly and death for uh, for the believer will be used by God, the death of the believer will be used by God to sanctify his people, how the thought of death sanctifies his people. In the same way, the idea of judgment, that believers will enter into judgment, should have a sanctifying effect on the people of God. 
We need to be well-pleasing to him. Why? Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us appearing before the judgment seat of Christ may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, let's make some observations uh, in verse 10, beginning with this one. The first fact in verse 10 is that we must all appear. All believers will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Not just some believers, but all believers. Now, for this reason, theologians through the centuries have called this a general judgment. It includes all believers. But secondly, considering observations on verse 10, notice where we will appear. We appear before the judgment seat of our judge, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing. Other places... For example, this morning we talked about John chapter 15. Other places refer to God being our judge. There is a sense in which we'll be judged by the triune God. However, many texts in scripture refer to the Lord Jesus Christ being the one who's been allocated by God to judge the living and the dead. Now, Christ is given authority to judge. And as we talked about this morning a little bit, that authority to judge is a part of his exaltation. It's a part of the, the right, if you will, given to the king to, on his throne, execute judgment of the people. Judgment, then, is one of the crowning honors of his kingship. Listen to John chapter 5, and beginning in verse 26, where the Lord says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because of his position, because of his title, because he has come. He is the Son of Man. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth. And this speaks of judgment, right? A full and final judgment of all believers, unbelievers. Every knee will bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's an aspect in which the judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is given to exalt the Son, exalt the Son of Man. But thirdly, notice that we're going to be judged according to what we've done in this life. In verse 10, we're going to receive the things done in the body according to what we have done, whether good or bad. So we're going to be judged according to what we've done in this life, whether good or bad. Now, verse 10 explains that the standard of judgment, the standard of the judgment for believers will be our works. Our works, the things we've done, whether good or bad. Now, that standard by which God judges our works is the revealed will of God, his law. According to the law of God, then believers are judged according to their works. Now, for those who appear in judgment, entrance into or exclusion from heaven will only depend upon whether they have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ or not. And this is where sometimes confusion comes in. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is purely and entirely a gift of God. But we're judged according to our works, whether good or bad, everything we've done in the body. So for those who appear in judgment, entrance into heaven or exclusion from heaven is based entirely on whether or not they are clothed in the righteousness, the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that judgment, as far as the standard of judgment goes, for believers... There are going to be rewards. There are different degrees with respect to judgment. There are different degrees both of the bliss of heaven and different degrees of the punishment of hell. And these degrees of judgment will be determined by what is done in the flesh. Let me give you a couple of examples of that. Look with me at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. The standard of judgment is going to be God's holy law According to his holy law, he will judge believers according to their works, whether good or bad. 
And then according to those works, there will be standards or degrees of reward. For the wicked, standard or degrees, standards or degrees of punishment. If you look at Matthew chapter 11, drop down to verse 20. Just one example of this idea from scripture. In verse 20, the Bible says, then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Verse 21, he says, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which are done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. You see the degrees of judgment? I mean, the degrees of judgment here illustrated with these godless cities. Flip over a few pages to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And here, with respect to the parable of the talents, you get the sense from the parable of the talents that this also applies to the rewards that believers are given or not given, the degrees of rewards for believers in judgment uh, as told or described here through the parable of the talents. Look at verse 14. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Compare that, if you will, to places in Scripture um, where the Bible says that each one is given a measure of faith, right? Same kind of principle. They're given each one according to his own ability. Verse 16, And he would receive the five talents, went in and traveled with them, and made another five talents. Likewise, he would receive two, gain two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he had received, who had received the five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were ruler over many things, enter into, or you were faithful over a few things that will make you ruler over many things, enter into the joy of your Lord. So it sounds like, uh, reward given to a faithful believer, right? Verse 22. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. What does it mean there to enter into the joy of the Lord? It means to enter into the joy <laughs> into the joy of the Lord. That's heaven, that's bliss, right? That's, uh, that's, that's the believer going to be with the Lord. Verse 24, then he who had received the one talent came and said, and again, you've got here uh, two good and faithful servants entering into the joy of their Lord, and you've got this third scoundrel here uh, who has a different destination. He received the one talent and came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed, and I was afraid. And went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And look at verse 30, a judgment of the unbeliever. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So now explaining again, back in uh, 2 Corinthians here, chapter 5, verse 10, we're looking at the standard of judgment. Standard of judgment, God's holy law according to what believers have done in the body, whether good or evil, and that judged by degree, uh, different degrees, both of the bliss of heaven and of the punishments of hell. God, it says there, will give to every man according to his due. Now, if we think about that judgment of believers, 
And again, through studying the word of God and uh, putting together, if you will, a systematic theology of judgment, theologians have looked at three parts, three component parts of the judgment, specifically here, the judgment of believers. The first part concerning the judgment of believers is the examination of their works. It's the examination of their works. God in judgment for believers, right? For believers will bring to light the whole past life of man. All that he has done in the body, whether good or bad, all right? Even the thoughts and the secret intents of the heart. God is going to expose that even for believers. This is symbolically represented in scripture as the opening of the books. We talked about the opening of the books in Daniel chapter seven or the opening of the books in Revelation chapter 20. A judge usually has a book of his law And then a record of those who appear before him. Now, God is omniscient. So God perfectly and fully knows that record. He knows every thought. He knows every intent of your heart. And in judgment, in the examination of our works, God exposes everything that we've done in the body, whether good or evil. And that's for the judgment of the believer and the judgment of the unbeliever alike. We get that from verse 10 in 2 Corinthians here, chapter 5. First part of the judgment, component part of the judgment is examination of their works. Second component of the judgment will be a delivery of the sentence. Will be a delivery of the sentence. The day of judgment is a day of wrath for the ungodly and of the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. All must be revealed before the judge. And there's a sense in which justice demands this, God's justice. In one sense, uh, God's justice will be vindicated on the wicked and God's justice will be glorified in his grace and his mercy to the believer. But the sense of justice demands that all must be revealed before the judge. The sentence pronounced upon each person, as we look at these various texts, will not be secret. They'll not be known to that person only, but sense that we have from scriptures that they will be publicly proclaimed. And in that, the righteousness and grace of God will shine. Uh, the grace and mercy of God to believers will be glorified. Uh, thirdly, first you have the examination of the work. Secondly, the delivery of the sentence. And then thirdly, the actual sentence, the righteous will convey everlasting blessedness and the wicked to everlasting misery. So the judge will divide mankind into two parts as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The final judgment determines the final state of who will appear before the judgment seat, either everlasting misery or everlasting blessedness. Now, in considering these points regarding the judgment, we still haven't answered our questions. Why do believers enter into judgment? Why do believers enter into judgment? Well, first, let's answer that question by saying what judgment is not. What judgment is not. The final judgment for believers or unbelievers, the final judgment is not for the purpose of deciding what should be the future state of man. It's already been determined. John chapter three, unbelievers are condemned already. The final judgment is not for the purpose of deciding what should be the future state of man. Secondly, let's talk about what it is then. The purpose of judgment is is to display the glory of God. In a final act of judgment, God, in glorifying himself, on the one hand, magnifies his holiness, magnifies his righteousness, magnifies his justice, and on the other hand, magnifies his grace and magnifies his mercy. Judgment is about the glory of God. Also, In his capacity as judge, Christ glorifies himself in saving his people fully and finally to the uttermost. He completes their redemption, so to speak. He justifies them publicly and saves them to the uttermost through this final act of judgment. That's said in scripture that this will be revealed, this judgment often to pardon sins, It's an error. It's not pardoning sins. That has already been determined. But the Bible also says that men have to be judged for every idle word. They'll be judged for every secret, every secret three, 
thing, Romans chapter 2. Every idle word, Matthew chapter 12. There's no indication whatsoever that this is going to be limited to the wicked. So it includes believers who will be judged for every idle word, judged over every secret thing. And moreover, it's evident from several passages that the righteous will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So if you think about this now in the judgment of the wicked, what is the purpose or the judgment of the believer? What is the purpose of this judgment? Why are believers judged? Why are believers judged? Why are they judged according to their works? And why are the deeds done in the body the evidence by which God judges them? First is this. The judgment, this judgment, the judgment of believers, the final judgment of believers and unbelievers will declare who is lost and who is saved based on their works. Now think through that with me. This judgment will declare who is lost and who is saved according to their works. Secondly, the judgment and the judgment for believers will declare the measure of your reward according to your works. The measure of your reward according to your works. Now the first, let's take point one and then point two. In point one, judgment will declare who is lost and who is saved according to their works. The biggest problem for that with most people thinking about the judgment of believers is it seems to contradict Ephesians chapter two. Seems to contradict that salvation is by grace through faith. By grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation, we know from scripture, is not of works. You can't work to earn salvation. Work your works don't earn you favor with God. Your work doesn't merit debt from God or payment from God. That contradicts grace. And grace, again, and salvation is given as a free gift received by faith and not earned by works. So how is it then that the judgment will declare who's lost and who's saved according to their works? Now, the answer is in a couple of texts and a couple of sentences where our deeds become the evidence brought forth in the court to demonstrate that our faith is real. Look at with me uh, quickly at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And in judging according to works, it's the works that demonstrate for believers that their faith is real, for unbelievers that their faith is absent. And that's evidenced in their works. Matthew chapter 25, and we'll do this quickly just to give you an idea here. For example, look at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he'll separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He'll set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from before the foundation of the world because, verse 35, I was hungry and you gave me food. Because I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. It sounds like entrance into the kingdom is based on works. Not in an ultimate sense. Ultimately, entrance into the kingdom is based on faith in Christ. By grace, through faith. Works are the evidence of that faith. Works are the evidence that that faith was real, right? In the same way, works of the ungodly prove the absence of their faith. He'll say to those in verse 41, he'll just say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in, and naked, you did not clothe me, and sick in prison, and you did not visit me. So again, works. Look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And again, works either confirming and affirming genuine saving faith, or works being the evidence of a lack of genuine saving faith. John chapter 5, look down beginning at verse 29. 28. Verse 28, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Again, in life, we're judged according to our works. 
our works either prove, confirm, and affirm genuine saving faith, or they prove, give evidence of the lack of genuine saving faith. And that goes hand in hand with what we were talking about this morning in John chapter 14, doesn't it? That genuine saving faith, if it's a living faith, will produce fruits of obedience in the life of a Christian. Uh, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So it's the same kind of principle here. Um, We'll keep going just for sake of time. So first, the deeds that we're judged by give evidence of faith or lack of faith. Faith, genuine saving faith in the life of the believer or an absence of faith in the ungodly. Secondly, secondly, our deeds will be the evidence brought forth to demonstrate the varying measures of our obedience in faith for the purpose of rewards. Our deeds will be used to judge for rewards. Okay, listen to this from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul says in verse 8, He who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 8, Paul says, Whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord. So in other words, salvation is by faith, rewards are by faith, but the evidence of faith in the judgment of believers will be works. Does that make sense? Okay, so now our deeds are not the basis or the foundation or the ground of our salvation. Our works are the evidence of our salvation. They're not the foundation, they're the demonstration, the evidence. Heard this illustration, I thought this was very helpful uh, from a pastor. Um, And he talked about the illustration of the two women, if you remember this story from 1 Kings chapter 3, the two women, the two harlots who brought a baby to King Solomon. Remember that story, right? Both of the women claimed that the, ba- the baby belonged to them. So they asked King Solomon to act as a judge between them. Two harlots, one baby, who does the baby belong to, right? So King Solomon had a tough decision. King Solomon acted as the judge. So he asked that a sword be brought and that the baby should be divided in two, half given to one lady and half given to the other. A wise judgment on the part of King Solomon. The true mother cried out, oh my Lord, give her the child and by no means kill, kill it. So Solomon knew instantaneously from the way that the woman responded, whose the baby was, where, who the baby belonged to. So now in that act of judgment, what was Solomon looking for? He wasn't looking for some act on the part of one of the two ladies that would earn the baby. Does that make sense? He was looking for an act that would confirm or affirm or prove who the baby belonged to and who the child was born to. That's the way that God looks at our deeds in judgment. He's not looking for deeds that earn merit or earn favor or earn salvation. He's looking for works that prove we are saved, prove that we have genuine saving faith. The only purchase of our salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ dying for us at Calvary. And that death sufficient to cover all sin, all penalty, all judgment. He is a full and complete and sufficient savior. And we are saved by grace through faith alone. But that judgment according to works. You know, it's interesting that as you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we saw there the application in verse 9, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. These thoughts of appearing before the judgment seat of Christ should motivate us to obedience, motivate us to live a life of fervent love and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, to be well-pleasing to him. But then look at the application of these truths in verse 11 to the gospel. In verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We are well known to God and I also trust are well known in your consciences. You know, in thinking about judgment and thinking about standing before our God who is a consuming fire, we, in thinking about these things and thinking about the righteous judgment of God, knowing the terror of the Lord should respond by persuading men. Now, I've, you know, thought on this passage before that 
in one aspect or often one reason why believers aren't as faithful in evangelism as they should be is because they don't know the terror of the Lord. You know, we lose sight of this aspect of judgment. We lose sight of the terror of God in judgment. And so we aren't roused to persuade men. So that's you, that's me. We need to consider holy God in his righteous judgment and persuade men, amen? All right, let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to walk through this passage, Lord, and thank you for the opportunity to think on these things. I pray, Lord, that we'd be continually mindful of them, that we would have our feet firmly planted in your word, our hand to the plow, and our hearts in heaven for your glory, God, in Jesus' name, amen.